imagine a biologist who only studied plants? It's not hard, because that's what scientists do. They specialize. They learn as much as possible, as deeply as possible, become an expert. But imagine now that that scientist said that he or she was studying all living things, the, the nature of life, and they, they took for granted that the insights gained from studying plants told them everything they needed to know about how all living things worked. Mushrooms and lichens, animals of all sorts, insects, even though we know of about four times as many insects as plant species. Of the species of life we've cataloged, plants make up less than 17%. That is the current situation in psychology. Actually, it's worse. As a number of psychologists have pointed out, their research disproportionately examines people from their own home countries, from the wealthiest, most industrialized nations. Even within those countries, the subjects that they test are disproportionately university students, young adults who happen to register for an introductory psychology class. These are the vast majority of recruits for psychology experiments. To put it another way, if you're a university student, you are 4,000 times more likely to get recruited for psychology research than any other person. Psychologist Jeffrey Arnett reported in a 2008 article in American Psychologist that 96% of all subjects in psychology research were drawn from countries that represented only 12% of the world's total population. 12% of all people are left-handed. In the UK, about 12% of the population experiences depression each year. In Australia, 12% live below the poverty line. Earlier this year, the Eurozone had 12% unemployment. In the U.S., 12% of adults have diabetes. California has 12% of the U.S. population. Only 12% of us stick with our New Year's resolutions. So does it really sound to base our understanding of human nature on a close study of only 12%? Because even within these countries, undergrads are the predominant subject. Arnett suggested that psychology research was really neglecting 95% of the world's population. Some psychologists are acutely aware of this problem, and they, they push their field to be more global, more interested in the variety of human nature. In 2010, Joseph Henrich, Stephen Hein, and Ara Noyan wrote an article that laid out the problem in detail. They suggested that psychology subjects were the weirdest people in the world. By that, they meant the way subjects were recruited was biased to favor people who were Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. We know lots psychologically about weird people, less so about the rest of us. The sampling bias wouldn't be a problem if we could be confident that everyone else on the planet resembled the weird people. Uh, some psychologists may, might be working with that assumption, but Henrich Hein and Noren Zayn make clear what a problem this is. That is, weird people are weird in another sense. Whenever we have good cross-cultural psychology data, weird subjects aren't normal or average or even just a little bit different. They're often real outliers. If you play strategy games meant to test people's sense of fairness, for example, weird subjects behave in extreme ways compared to other groups, such as herding peoples or foragers or miners elsewhere in the world. In fact, when Henrich and his colleagues looked at the data, weird subjects turned out to be outliers on virtually everything they could find data on, visual perception, fairness, cooperation, spatial reasoning, categorization and inferential induction, that is the way that we extrapolate from what we already know moral reasoning, reasoning style, self-concepts and related motivations, the heritability of IQ, even really basic sensory factors like whether or not you fall for an optical illusion turn out to suggest that Western subjects are outliers. Weird subjects, for example, fall the most for the Mueller liar illusion. In some populations, this simply is not an illusion. If you're a sawn forager or a South African miner, you're liable to see at a glance that these lines are the same length. Cross-cultural psychologists think that it takes living in a world of perfectly right-angled rooms and carpentered spaces to train your visual system to think that these lines are different lengths. As they write in their conclusion, Henrich and his colleagues say, although we are certainly not the first to worry about the representativeness of prevalent undergraduate samples in the behavioral sciences, our efforts to compile an empirical case have revealed an even more alarming situation than previously recognized. The sample of contemporary Western undergraduates that so overwhelms our database is not just an extraordinarily restricted sample of humanity. It is frequently a distinct outlier vis-a-vis -vis other global samples. It may represent the worst population on which to base our understanding of Homo sapiens. But there are two additional issues with the possibility of extrapolating from weird subjects. First, the very description weird, wealthy, educated, industrialized, and so on, might be self-flattering. It's how Westerners and other wealthy people like to think of themselves. Elsewhere, I've argued that it may not be the weird qualities that make these subjects such outliers. Maybe Western University students are outliers because they're myopics. That is, they're materialist, whereas other people inhabit a world of spirits and non-material forces. 
Westerners tend to think that objects and non-objects are clearly distinct. They're young, not just because they're university students, but even in relation to people the same age in other societies, who may already have families and leadership roles in the community. Myopics may be more self-obsessed in a variety of ways, including the idea of building a career, investing in your future, and not having a strong corporate identity like a clan or a group. They may be pleasure-seeking and pain aversion to a greater degree than other people. University students, especially in U.S. research universities, may ironically be more socially isolated, sometimes living in age-graded residential colleges where they don't interact much with older or younger people. Myopics also live in a pervasive consumerist society. They often have identities that are based not on production or occupation, but on consumption. And finally, Westerners in general are terribly sedentary. By every single measure we have, which may shape our psyches and, and nervous systems in powerful ways. The second problem is that our understanding of human psychology is not only built disproportionately on studying these types of people, it's disproportionately built by these types of people, shaped by the questions that weird researchers ask, by the fascinations and blind spots of this group of people who we know are outliers. To borrow from Donald Rumsfeld, it's not just the things we know we don't know, it's the unknown unknowns, the questions that psychologists haven't asked about human experience because we don't even know that we haven't asked them. This is one place that psychological anthropology and neuroanthropology comes in, I hope. Anthropologists are accustomed to exploring alongside people who are quite different to us, that is weird in their own ways, the many ways that human beings are. We don't have to imagine human variation or try to derive it from university students. We can talk with those who live in different ways, study their songs, their mythologies, rituals, day-to-day -day lives, and learn more about what is possible. It's not really a problem if you're weird. It's, it's more of a problem if you don't know that you are.